Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Brigitte van Tigelen, a historian of science who holds several appointments. She is director of the European Operations at the Science History Institute. She is chair for the Division of History of Chemistry inside the European Chemical Society, and she is associate at the Centre de Recherche d'Histoire des Sciences de l'Union. Université Catholique de Louvain à Louvain la Neuve in Belgium. You may remember Brigitte from episode number seven of this podcast. She was a guest on the occasion of Marie Curie's birthday in November 2018, talking about the life of Marie Curie, who is an icon of science. Today we meet again to further explore this concept of icons in science. This is part of a larger discussion on the the rhetoric of science. So without further ado, welcome Brigitte, it's so nice to have you back. Thank you for having me Federica, I'm really glad to be back. When last time we talked about Marie Curie, what we tried to do was to reconciliate Marie Curie the icon with Marie Curie the person. The person is oftentimes less known than the icon. And Marie Curie is, of course, not the only one to have become an icon in her field. A male counterpart in science is, of course, Albert Einstein, but we can think of Mozart in music and Michelangelo in the arts. So can you talk a little bit about what icons are and why it happens that some individuals transcend their simple human life and become icons? Well, I'm going to take a long way to answer your question. Uh, and I'm going to start with the international years. Uh, UNESCO has every year at least two or three international years. This year, one of them is dedicated to a scientific topic, which doesn't happen all the time. And it is the international year of the periodic table of the chemical elements. That's the long version, and there's a short way to say it, it's IYPT, International Year of the Periodic Table. There has been other years devoted to a scientific topic. There has been two international years of chemistry, one of physics, one of light, one of crystallography, and so on. And it's always to celebrate a specific domain of science, to celebrate not just what is going on, but also a look back. And it's very striking that in all of these international years, there has always been a historical ingredient. For instance, the International Year of Physics in 2005 was linked with Albert Einstein's so-called Anus Mirabilis, 1905, in which he published a series of seminal papers. So the, the whole of the community was a, in a way connected to the myth of the origins. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really interesting. It sometimes is not just the origins. In the case of 2011, the International Year of Chemistry, it was linked to the second Nobel Prize of Marie Curie, 1911, the one she actually received alone. And it was a Nobel Prize for her work on the discovery and the characterization of two elements she had discovered with her husband and other people, but mainly with her husband, polonium and radium. So again, it was a way of putting a myth at the origin or at the reason for celebrating. And I think this is interesting. This year, in a way, is even more interesting because the periodic table is always said to have been invented or discovered. Those two words are different, but it's interesting to talk about the discovery of something that man made. And it has been uh, proposed in um, 1869, by Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev, and 
I would say here the sense of history is even bigger than before because it's a 150th anniversary. If you go online, Google IYPT, you will see the page and the logo appear. You have the face of Mendeleev, which is very telling. And again, you have this idea that there is a start with one man, one action, one place. Everything happens all of a sudden like in a fairy tale. And this is where I think we can start thinking about heroes of science and what do we miss about the history and the nature of science and the nature of scientific community when we just tell the story with our heroes. So it seems pretty obvious that associating a person to something like the periodic table makes that thing more relatable. It gives you a chance to tell a story around and about that thing. But I think that where we want to go with this discussion today is in a direction that explores how there may be a dark side to doing this. Am I right? You are very right, Federica. On the one hand, all these stories of science are always intended, at least from those who are telling it and who are not making hagiography or trying to, uh, to found a specific domain and then they have to have fathers, founding fathers, founding mothers. Um, but generally, there is a good intention behind telling those stories. Exactly what you said is giving humanity to science. You know, science is done by people. Where the problem starts is when these people are stated or presented as heroes, as lonely heroes. Uh, sometimes this family context is explained. For instance, in Medelev's case, his mother who was, they were from a rather poor family or poor circumstances. She insisted on him having a good education and so on. But then afterwards, it becomes a kind of lonely trajectory. And a lot of all what builds a person, which is encounters, bad problems, having to face them, um, controversies, Sometimes also bad behavior, stealing things, not quoting this and that person, not, not making a, a reference. All these things are really channeled into the story so that the story remains linear. And of course, that's an easy way to tell a story. You have a beginning, you have a quest, you have a hero, you have problems along the line. And then in the end, the hero triumphs. So... There is a, a good intention, but there is a bad tool. And the tool actually reveals the dark side of these heroic stories. And uh, basically, just in the case of Mendeleev, luckily enough, uh, historians have investigated that over and over again. But Mendeleev is not the only one to propose a classification. He is not the only one to propose a table. And there has been a lot of history uh, work done on predecessors, contemporaries who also had a system they proposed. And there has been some studies, but less, about why one system survived. Because, of course, the easy answer is always to say, well, it's because he was right. Or the best. Or the best. Or the most suitable. But we all know, you and I, that sometimes, let's say in nowadays in technological area, it's not necessarily the best device that survives. There is a lot of marketing, there is knowing the users, the audience. And for instance, in this case, there was a lot of persistence from Mendeleev, but he had also a fan base, so to speak, who made sure that he he would be known, his ideas disseminated, and so on. And also, he was adamant to claim, this is mine, this is my ID, and so on. Uh, just so your auditors or your audience knows, 
very much at the same time as Mendeleev, a German chemical professor, Lothar Mayer, also suggested a classification of the elements. And he was less adamant to defend his system compared to Mendeleev. That's one thing. But it is really telling that at one point, further down, so this was in in the 60s, the end of the 60s, 1860s, further down, when the system of the periodic table were at last regarded as something really useful by the chemical community, the Royal Society of Chemistry supported and gave an award to both of them. Mm -hmm. So the story is complicated, it's complex. Again, talking about Marie Curie last time, we observed that icons can actually do a disservice to the community in that they are not relatable. We say, oh, but she was a genius or Einstein was a genius, like everything came easy to them. And that is not the case. So when we talked about the struggles in Marie Curie's life, we observed that to know the real story makes her gain power as a role model, as an inspiration. That's why it's fair to say that icons can do a disservice to the community. But becoming an icon can also have some negative effects on the person who actually becomes an icon. Was this the case of Marie Curie or Mendeleev? Do we find Mendeleev hurt or damaged by notoriety in this new condition? It is hurtful to Mendeleev in a way, as well as it was hurtful to Marie Curie, this stardom, so to speak. Because once you write a story where the hero, after having, so to speak, slain dragons, is triumphant, Then the problem is when this hero, be it Mendeleev, Einstein, Marie Curie, makes a mistake, we are at pain at explaining these mistakes. Are these statements that are not confirmed and so on, or misunderstandings? And it is always then the question from the general public is, why such a genius couldn't understand this or that? So it does hurt the hero of the story, because in the fairy tales, the story ends at the summit when the discovery or the new theory is accepted. But of course, these scientists, they have a life after. I mean, they don't stop like they get married and and live happily ever after. They continue their scientific investigation and they are back, not completely to their former situation, but in terms of cognition, I mean, they are not the genius that are claimed, that others claim they are. So they are faced with difficulties that other researchers will still have. Maybe they have more access to money, access to better assistants or technicians or better uh, labs and so on, but they are still human minds and human brains. So that's a way it can hurt. In general, it also hurts, I would say, the community. You know, in that way, it's just the nature of science that is hurt in this uh, way to narrate history. A colleague of mine from uh, Norway, Annette Lückness, a professor at NTNU in Trondheim, and I are editing a collective volume on women behind the periodic table. It's called Women and Their Elements. It's going to be published um, in August uh, this year. It could have been called Let's Not Talk About Marie Curie, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, because um, I told the story about the periodic table and Mendeleev. I say they are contenders. They are all males, of course, because that's uh, the visible part of the community. And it was, of course, uh, mainly at that time, chemists were mainly male. Um, and of course, other male historians have written the story about these male contenders of Mendeleev's. And when you go to women, of course, there's Marie Curie, who with her husband is credited to have found two elements. 
Then there's another one, also finding elements. It's Ida Nodak with her husband and another co-worker. And then there's Lisa Meitner, not with her husband, but with a co-worker, Otto Hahn. And then there's one woman all alone, Marguerite Perret. But that doesn't make a lot, does it? Mm-hmm. If I may ask, can you clarify the difference between proposing the system or filling the gaps? Because I know that, you know, some elements were discovered later on. So this periodic table had holes, so to speak. So these women, were they involved in building the system or they contributed to filling the gaps? It's a very good question. Um in our book, we are trying to address the whole of the, this issue. So there is no female proposer of a periodic system. That's, that's for sure. And what we discovered through this project is that there are women behind the periodic table. That is, that have contributed at one moment to at one stage, precise stage, but very much needed stage, to either help the shaping of this periodic system, or as you say, fill in the gaps, or even when elements are discovered, the story is far to end. Elements have properties. Elements, one discovers the toxicity of this, the, the magnificent, wonderful uh, new property of that, and it is used. So, Life does not end when the periodic table is set, and it does not end when the periodic table is filled either. So that there's a lot. And then also there's all the understanding behind the periodic table, because you put all the elements according to their rising atomic weight. Now we use the atomic number, but that's that's not the, the problem or the, 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 the question. But once you have that, there's all sorts of new theories of chemistry that have appeared in the meantime. When Mendeleev proposes this first classification and ends up saying this is a system and there's a law underlying it, they're still debating about whether or not atoms exist. Mm-hmm. Not to mention we knew nothing about the structure of atoms the nuclear charge, the electronic configuration, and so on. We know nothing about isotopes. We know nothing about radioactivity. We know nothing about all a bunch of things that actually the periodic table can still accommodate over all this time. So this is why we wanted also to have a long story of the periodic table and a long story of the woman behind the periodic table. Can you give an example of the contribution that some of these women behind the periodic table gave a type of behind-the-scenes work? At the time of Mendeleev, women in Russia had emigrated a lot to our Western countries to get university education. This is the weird thing At that time, women education at the university level was not favored in our countries. But since they were coming from abroad, so to speak, it was not going to change the social habits. They were stranger foreigners. They would go back or whatever their career would be. I mean, they would still remain the foreigners. Mm -hmm. And um, these women were really tempted to come to have an education because Just before, for a short period, in Russia, Tsarist Russia, there was an opening for women education. And then it was stopped. So they had to find elsewhere what they could not find uh, at home anymore. One of these women, Yulia Lermontova, she decided to go with another woman. So they would go together or they would, you know, get married just for the sake of being with a chaperone. Sometimes the marriage was just fake. She decides to go with another well-known woman, Sofia Kowalewskaya. She's a very famous mathematician. And she goes and she goes on to study chemistry. Of course, Mendeleev and other chemists at that time knew about that. And Mendeleev was very supportive of women education. So he knew about her. He also knew that she was doing very well. And he's setting up his table. 
as I said, according to atomic weights. The problem is that to put them in the right order, you need a precise atomic weight. To have a precise atomic weight, you need that the substances you are dealing with are pure. And to have them pure means that you have devised analytical chemical separation methods that are very reliable and very effective. That was a problem with platinum metals. Those are metals from, I would say, the middle of the periodic table around platinum. And they occur in the same mineral ores sometimes, most of the time, together. So you really have to separate them. And that was really a difficult thing. So Mendeleev has this trouble, and he writes to Yulia Lermontova and says, uh, since you're in Heidelberg, where Bunsen, a very famous chemist, is working, and Bunsen is working on new separation methods, could you please, you know, get to know these methods? Could, could you um, investigate the matter and so on? And so the only trace of this we only have in Mendeleev's archives. But this is a contribution. This is a behind-the-scenes contribution. It, it didn't solve the problem. But this is a very good example of the shadows in which a lot of things were done before a few men, Mendeleev included, could come up with a general solution to a general problem. And in our book, that's what we're trying to achieve, is, is to really showcase those women showcase how they relate to the problem of setting up a classification and a system, and also not go into a heroic story. Because if we replace heroic stories of men with heroic stories of women, we're not an inch further. We're just falling in the same dark side we were talking about. There is another way in which the hero myth does not reflect the way in which science is done today, and that is in groups, teams. There are networks of people and organizations. Can it be that the hero myth reflects an ancient way of doing science? You know, before it was institutionalized, when you had this isolated wealthy, normally, individuals in their Wunderkammer, the cabinets of curiosities. But was it isolated? Were these individuals actually working alone? So uh, th this goes back to the Republic of Letters, which is um, a concept invented uh, in the early modern period and put forward as, I would say, the first form of scientific community or savant community, because science maybe is not the right word for the 16th, 17th and 18th century. But you are right that the teams were smaller, Inside the teams, there was a hierarchy between the technician, most of the time invisible. You don't know anything about technicians. Sometimes in, in pictures, you can see them working, but they don't have a name. Of course, they don't appear in the publication. Nevertheless, there was already teamwork. A good example of that is Lavoisier. And the way he navigated teamwork communal enterprise, marketing, and making sure in the end his name was kind of above, so to speak, the teamwork. So we are in France, 18th century, second half of the 18th century. He is uh, not really high nobleman, but he's very well off because he's actually collecting the taxes for the king, the French king. And uh, he has a lot of time uh, on his own, and he's also very devoted to science. And he wants to learn science in a very efficient way, so he goes step by step and realizes that there is a way to do chemistry that uses the logic of mathematics. Basically, it's making balances, what comes in, what comes out, and the famous uh, law of Lavoisier. Nothing is created, nothing is destroyed, everything transforms or is transformed. 
Interestingly, uh, Lavoisier's story also has been told as a hero, as the founder of modern chemistry and so on. Interestingly, also all the scholarly work in historiography has tried to evaluate, you know, what was a part of the genius, what was a part of... And again, the social, and maybe if I tweak the argument a little bit further, the feminine side has been left aside because... You don't invent all alone. You have to communicate. You have to have counter-arguments. You have to fight uh, with your... You have to struggle and bring your ideas to your colleagues and so on. And he was very uh, good at marketing and, so to speak, engaging scholars or savants of the time to come and work with him. And so he could exchange, he could discuss, he could convert them. So, which is another another opening. Uh, so there is something quite religious about science and being right. That's another topic we could also explore one day. But what I mean is that he is really in relation with this community. And he can do that. He can afford that because he's a member of a very powerful node in this Republic of Letters Center uh, network. He is a member of the... French Academy of Science. So that's a powerful situation. And uh, he's able to publish, he's able to spread the word, he's able to attract others who either have a high position and, you know, through these high position, he can spread the word or he can also attract the younger generation, which if you want to make a change, it's always best to address the younger generation because they're going to they're kind of forward the new ideas. And about the feminine side is that um, it is more and more recognized now that Madame Lavoisier did more than just take notes because we see her writing in the laboratory notes or organized salon. She wasn't really an assistant because there was someone who take care of those tedious tasks, but she was very much an asset in Lavoisier's strategy. First off, she entered in marriage very young. She had a big admiration for her husband. She was taught modern languages like English and Italian because her husband didn't know them. So he would uh, be able to reach out to other communities. She learned how to draw and to etch. She was the one who made the tables and the figures in Lavoisier's Traité Elementaire. And she was also a salonnière and a very good um, correspondence writer. Moreover, and I think this is often forgotten, when Lavoisier um, was beheaded because of the revolution, the revolutionary times in 1795, she fought until she got what she wanted. She fought to get back all the archives, all the instruments, all the papers and also belongings that had been confiscated by the French Republic. So she prepared the way for a heroization of her husband. And if you look at all the heroes of science, it's really telling that either a family member or a close, I would say almost a spiritual family member, like a student or a postdoc, we would say, that has this admiration for the man, creates all the basis for the heroic stories. In the case of Marie Curie, it's very clear She wrote the biography of her husband and her daughter, the one who was not doing chemistry, wrote the biography of her mother. So there is a kind of freezing in this heroic role by people who we don't always look at, but who are really instrumental in this heroization process. So it seems certain that science is better done in teams. And this has always been the case, not just today that teamwork is built into the structure of the institution, of how science is organized. So if you have a great idea, but you're in the middle of the woods, 
the quality of that idea is irrelevant. You got to be part of a community. And this has always been the case, not just today. Of course, of course. Uh, science is foremost a human activity. And this is why it is so sad in a way that these heroic stories, while they try to convey the human side of science, actually miss the point. I think it's especially clear in our times where, as you say, we have huge project. Let's say, you know, finding the Higgs boson. It can't be pinned down to one person. The Nobel Prize has been given to those who had the ID and were successful enough to promote it, to convince their peers and to convince peers who were able to convince others and fundraise and, and do all the, this big machine. But in this big machine, every person counts. And sometimes it is seen like, you know, there's the thinking head and then there are the others and the others can be interchangeable, which is very dehumanizing in a way. It's, it's, it's not human. It's like they're just pions. And um, this is where our book on the women in their element is kind of an interesting challenge because on the one hand, we want to bring to the fore sometimes technicians, sometimes people who for some reasons didn't make to be public persona, but nevertheless had an input. And we really insist not to go to the heroic side for these people, because then we're not moving one inch. You know, the danger, for instance, would be to say, oh, this or that person, she didn't have access, she could have done this, she would have deserved a Nobel Prize. I mean, there's a lot of story that is kind of, I don't know how to say, retrospective conditional history. So, for instance, this person should have gotten the Nobel Prize. Well, I see the point, but the real question is, how can we explain the process through which this person didn't have the Nobel Prize? And a lot of other people didn't have it, by the way, I mean, because of the selection process. And what does that tell us on how we value and how we award recognition and credit? That's the important question. But that's often a question that's left aside because it would really require the scientist, the scientific community, the whole system to think about itself in other ways. And I don't think we're there yet. Very interesting. This makes you want to rethink a lot of stories around science. This makes you think that we are just biased as humans and we tend to give more credit to some sources over others just because maybe they come from someone who got a Nobel Prize. And in a way it makes sense, but the thing is that we should always want to verify, be critical of the statements regardless of, of the source. That's the whole point of providing evidence of backing a statement up. Is it possible that we are underestimating, if not overlooking altogether, the human factor in all aspects of how science is done, in the results, in how the results are interpreted, in how science communication is done? It's a tough question. And I think that, again, we can only go step by step. And really important is to have a reflexive behavior. I'm not sure people at a very high level have always the time to reflect because they're so embedded in the processes, not just because they are, you know, the beneficiary of it, but I think it's just that it has become a way of structuring things. You get more funding if you are, uh, you have a better sign citation index uh, and so on. But there are things that are changing. For instance, now in, in a lot of um scientific journals after the end of the article and before the references, there is a statement that the authors have to make together. And in this statement, it is clarified what each author has contributed. So that I think that's a first step. And it's interesting because it ranges from I would say the instruments, who owns them, who got, you know, who got the funding, who made them work 
to the ideas, to the conversations, to the correction, to, to the discussion. So I think it is already a first step. Um, and that's that's really interesting. But it's still, I think, it's still hard to make the establishment think about itself. One example, I mean, it's it's a personal example, but, you know, that's the, the examples you know best, isn't it? Uh, Annette and I were asked to contribute uh, for Nature a comment piece exactly on the on the topic women behind the periodic table. And to that aim, we drew, of course, on this coming book and on contributions we haven't written. In this comment piece, it is the tradition or the usage not to make a lot of reference and not to make acknowledgments. And in our first, one of our first drafts, we thought, okay, we're going to write acknowledgments to all the authors of the contribution whose substance we are using to make our point, because that's only fair, isn't it? And um, we were told, no, we, we don't do acknowledgments. And so we discussed with the editor and said, look, we are trying to make a point that it's important to emphasize contribution. And that's how a lot of women and a lot of men as well have become invisible. So we would really be at odds with our own statement or position if we cannot include an acknowledgement. And uh, happily enough, uh, we were actually surprised with the response. They actually put the acknowledgement at the end of the text, which was even better. I mean, we wouldn't have dreamed of it. So I think that, you know, once you're conscious about this, you can start working step by step. Now, of course, this doesn't set a trend. Uh, I'm very aware of that. I mean, most people will just continue. But we were really happily surprised by the response of a very highly established, reputed journal who has its way of functioning since forever. And that we, two females, historians of science, were able to say, look, we want it differently and this is why, and that they could listen to our argument. So I think there's hope, but I think it's going to take some time to really make the system think about what they really are doing beyond uh, just saying, yes, everyone should work in teams and so on, and how they actually transfer that into the acknowledgement system. One step at a time, as I said. <laughs> Maybe, step by step, we could get to a point where we stop falling for the hero myths. Although I personally think that we could never get rid of them entirely because, like you pointed out, they also have a positive function. We admire them, they inspire us, so it's not just a matter of, you know, getting rid of them. But could we realistically do something to change the current narratives, can we debunk the hero myth? And what would happen next? We, we should debunk it uh, when we have something to put at the same place. Because as you rightly pointed out, this is a need. We need these histories. We need stories. And uh, this is why I would hope that historians of science get the message better across I would hope also that scientists read more of history and not think they just make it. And because they make it, they know it. I think they need some kind of training and education in, in social science in general and history, definitely. Because what I notice is that when you explain that on one-on-one -on -one or in a group to scientists, they actually agree. They fully agree. But they are not trained to think that way and they are not given the right, the right literature. So we need to come up with narratives and stories, for instance, of Marie Curie, that tell the story in a short way. I mean, not the big... <laughs> <laughs> the big biographies, heavy biographies that, uh, I mean, mainly only historians will read are very curious people. Uh, so we need to have something to put at least in contrast or superimposed to these heroic stories. And maybe also, and that's where social science would be need, is maybe also provide 
the scientists and equip them with some kind of ability to reflect on their own practice. Because I'm struck by the fact that it's not they don't want to do it. They just, they are not educated in that way. They are educated to jump to equation formulas and, and go to the lab or experience and, and, and look at the data and so on. But they are not educated to sit back, think, and what is it that what I'm doing? How does that relate to my, my belief system, my, my, the way I function, the way I, the way I relate to the establishment and so on. And not only they're not educated, but this is not even valued. Thank you for saying that. I could not agree more. This is in part why I have the podcast. It's my way of learning more and talking to very interesting people such as yourself in a way that diverges from the exact specific topic of my research project, but in a way that I believe makes me a better, more complete researcher and citizen. And I also agree with you that today young researchers are not really encouraged to learn more about history of science, for example, or the impact that science can have on society. Everyone just works on their specific topic. I do not like this state of affairs, so I do my best, you know, to try to combine my duties with this extras that I do. And I'm inspired by top scientists for whom I have endless admiration. People who took the time to be advocates, for example, for the disarmament of nuclear weapons. So it's not just about communicating your own science. It's really about trying to have an impact in society with the things you know and with what you represent as a scientist. It takes time to do that. It takes more time because you need to educate yourself on those things, on the political situation. And number three, it requires that you care. And I think that we're missing all three things, and I don't know which one is worse. So I'm often inspired by scientists like those who wrote and signed the Einstein-Russell Manifesto, for example. They were top scientists, and they had the time, and they cared enough to also be active in society in this other role, which is not a different role. In fact, it's just something that complements you as a scientist. I truly believe in that. Let me ask you something about something slightly related to this that is the only way maybe in which we as young researchers are encouraged today to engage with the generic public, so not with our peers, but people who don't necessarily understand or have the tools to understand the content of our research and that we need to be able to talk to and to explain what we do to. So we are encouraged to communicate our science on social media. Normally every research project has a website. We are encouraged to organize public events or lectures in schools and, you know, laudable initiatives like that. My podcast is just a more time-consuming way to do that, if you want. And my question for you is... Considering what you said about Lavoisier and how good he was in promoting himself, do you think that he would have been on Twitter a lot? You know, if you want to be known today, you cannot not be on social media. But is this the way? Is this an effective way to communicate science? And when we talk about communicating science, is this type of communication what we are talking about? So do I understand? Well, I mean, I'm not a user of Twitter, um, I have to confess, and I'm a very um, lousy user of Facebook, for instance. And I am not sure that those are formats that allow for a real communication and that it's always short because there's so much going on, you have to be incisive or, or you know, aggressive or very, I don't know how to say that, kind of brilliant in a marketed way. 
And I'm not sure that's the best way to convey. I would actually argue that in the end, it creates invisibility because there's so much noise. Mm -hmm. How do you pick up, how do you single what is really important? If you tell me that you are asked or required by your grant to tweet now and then, not when you have something significant to say, how will your voice be heard better when you really have to something to say? And how will you be able to articulate it? Because it's not just one idea, you know, it, it's it, when you come up. I mean, let's go back to the Mendeleev. When he came up with the first uh, layout, uh, he reworked it for years and he published, and again, and again, and some people con uh, had uh, details that were not working, and he reworked it. So we always think, and this is also the problem with these stories, that they put everything in one place, one moment, one time. The, the you know the, the ideas you like the, the <laughs> where where are you when it hits you? Yeah, exactly, and and there is a total uh, lack of recognizing this as a process. So I'm not sure how very punctual thing like Twitter and so on can serve the the um, the purpose. Uh, and about Lavoisier tweeting, I really don't know. I <laughs> I will have to think about that. I'm sure he he was a, a man using everything that he could be using. I mean, he was he was very efficient, and maybe he would have found a way to use Twitter. But this is conditional history, so I'm not going to go any further. I agree with you so much. And I think that the picture you're portraying makes so much sense, but it's not really how things are going today, is it? There is this fundamental rule of social media that says that you need to schedule your messages or be consistent. So put something out every week or so, a couple of days, or the audience will forget about you. So that means that one day... You might want to take a picture of yourself in the lab and say, hey, we're working on the periodic table today. Wink. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess they were doing that in correspondence, you know. But the correspondence was addressed to a chosen audience. Uh, I'm not sure how Twitter works. Uh, is the audience chosen? And it also seems to me that a lot of these social media, I mean, not only are focused on promoting yourself, not especially always your ideas, because as you say, they forget about you. But the point is not sharing you, it's sharing the ideas you have. So that's already a slight difference. But also it strikes me how much it creates reactions, aggressivity. I wouldn't even say controversies because controversies are centered on a content. It just it's very epidermical, if I may use this. This so, I, I would love to see how it works to disseminate stories and and real debunkings this way. I think that it only amplifies something that's already there. I am guilty of that. I have to admit that I'm guilty. I am on social media and I do share, you know collateral things about my research. Of course, like not the results of my research, but the visits I do to other research centers. And I was refractory to do it in the beginning, but because a little bit we are encouraged to do so, I tried, I started playing with it. And I have to tell you that I realized that what you create is a parallel narrative. And for me, it has had a positive effect in that it did expand my network, but not automatically. Like it just puts you in contact with more people because you get more visible. But then I selected the new contacts and I proactively established connections with them uh, with visits or with private communication that started then going in the direction of a serious professional collaboration. So I I built something on the superficial connection that I got thanks to being on social media. So I'm guilty, 
But for me, I can say that it's had a positive effect. But it's like a game. To communicate science and also to be engaged socially, public as a researcher, goes beyond this, clearly. There is something that you said in the last episode on Marie Curie that really struck me. And that is that someone like Marie Curie would probably not have been successful with today's evaluation system, with this pressure to be on social media, to also kind of be brilliant and look good. And because of her character and personality, she might not have been successful in this environment. That should have everyone think. I often wonder about those things. Um, And also, there are some values that, in the case of Marie Curie, Uh, She really impersonated them. Persistence, continuous devotion to her passion, science, and consistency. And uh, though she was a passionate person, she was consistent. And uh, I think that some of these people, like Marie Curie or even Einstein, are, if I can take a Belgian example, uh, Georges Lemaitre, I'm not sure if they had to be evaluated with the same system now about what kind of career they would have had. On the one hand, of course, one hopes from these heroic stories and these persistence and and the fact that they, they really had a very clear idea of what they wanted to achieve. The path to it wasn't clear, but I think they were really, they had their center really inside of themselves. But For instance, let's go to uh, Lemaitre. He was labeled as the father of the Big Bang Theory, which is something, isn't it? I mean, not the show on the TV, but <laughs> but the 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 real uh, theory of the the beginning of the universe. And uh, he did that as a very young person, and he wasn't taken seriously by some part of the scientific community. He was even mocked at one point, and that's where the name Big Bang came, because he was not talking about Big Bang. So really? it, it was it was yes, it was a, a way of of mocking the ID. Isn't that funny that it came out? And uh, it's only on his deathbed that he heard that there was um, a noise coming from uh, the universe that could be related to to uh, to the Big Bang, the original Big Bang, a sort of echo, that he only learned that on his dead bed. But in the meantime, he was able to have a career and a fruitful one in, in very different ways. He, he worked on computers. He was fascinated by, you know, the use of computers to do all these calculations, which he had done by hand. So he knew the, the power that was lying there and, and how much it would help. And again, to talk about the hero, initially he thought that the whole universe was in an atom. So he called it the primeval atom, l'atome primitif. And uh, this was based on a bad understanding, to put it mildly, of quantum mechanics. So for a long time, all his work was was put aside because of this bad understanding of this inability to do make quantum mechanics right. But here again, I think this is interesting to know is that he didn't understand that part, but he understand other parts better than others. And his Big Bang Theory in the end is not just his, it's also what others were able to build in and to... and to. But coming back to the evaluation, if he had to be evaluated on his first uh, IDs, well, it didn't take ground very rapidly, did it? And now when you think you have to be evaluated for a project in three years, five years is eternity, isn't it? Very true. That would have been difficult. So I would hope that at some point all this management of science goes back to a more reasonable pace with less less meticulosity, you know, not always following the numbers with all these tools of evaluation but maybe more trust. And here is where the human factor comes in again. Where is the trust in humans? You know, in the fact that if you trust this or that researcher with his research program, 
let him at least five, ten years and then evaluate. When I think of these things, I think of the case of Europe, for example, and I have to say that for how much I would like to be in a higher trust system that does not require of me that I say before I do anything and sometimes years before I do it, what the results will be and why this research matters to whom and quantify the number of people I will reach with my communication activities. You know, that's probably gone too far, but I totally understand why they cannot finance a research project with public money and just give it to you because you deserve to be trusted or they like you. I understand why that doesn't happen. It's again a matter of striking the right balance. One last question on the hero myth. We've been talking about Marie Curie and Einstein and in general, people who achieved something that they are remembered for that has a positive connotation. But is there an anti-hero in science? Oh, yes, there are a couple. But even then, you can reinvestigate the story. A big anti-hero in the history of chemistry is Fritz Haber. So Fritz Haber is a very interesting figure because he is from Jewish origin. He has converted to Lutheranism and uh, he made an excellent chemist. He was able to come up with an idea to extract nitrogen, uh, which is a very important ingredient to grow plants and crops. So this was a huge step and a huge solution to feed the world, so to speak. I mean, to put it in grandiose words. And uh, for that, he was indeed uh, awarded the Nobel Prize. But in the meantime comes uh, World War I. And he is engaged in creating chemical warfare. I see where you're going. Yes, he was the one behind the release of the first chemical gas on Ypres, so in Belgium, Ypres fields uh, in uh, 1915. So you have, you know, you have the double, double face genius, so to speak. And he used to say that, you know, in times of peace, uh, a scientist uh, belongs to the world, but in times of war, he actually belongs to his country. So he thought he was doing his patriotic duty. Now, two things about this story. First off, after the war, World War I, he was quite praised, but then came Nazism and anti-Semitism. And although he was a war hero in Germany, although he was an immense chemist, although he had converted to Protestantism, he uh, was led to flee Germany and he died on the way out somewhere in, in Switzerland. So that's one thing. You know, it's kind of, it's ironic, isn't it? The second thing I want to say is that you have this dark or anti-hero. And of course, there's a lot of stories around saying Germany used uh, chemical warfare. Uh, Haber was a bad uh, chemist because he used it against humanity. Now, the response of both French and British armies was immediate. Why was it immediate? Because they also had a program on chemical and sometimes even biological warfare. The question was really, who would be the first to dare? And so here again, you have the anti-hero Fritz Haber, but during the rest of the war, over the trenches, coming from both sides, there was chemical weapons used. And I think, again, here, you know, the dark anti-hero myth encapsulates the badness of at a very little point so that it doesn't spread. And here again, we have to consider the humans in all their dimensions. He became a scapegoat. Yes. Yeah, in a way, it, it is a scapegoat. It, it's also, I mean, more and more historians are writing on these periods, and uh, it's very clear. What, what I tell you is not my own research. I mean, this is a knowledge shared by my, uh, my colleagues, so it's well known. But again, it's not known by the public or by the scientists themselves. 
Let me thank you, Brigitte, for being on Technoculture for the second time. Speaking to you is so interesting and we all learn so much, I think. Thank you, Federica, and conversation with you is also interesting because I realize I have so much to tell. <laughs> Then maybe we have to have another episode together or we could have an entire podcast series on these topics. I think it's so interesting. But thank you for being here today. Thank you, Federica. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast. <laughs>